Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. Welcome to episode 160 of the Garden DC podcast. In this episode, we chat with Janet Draper, horticulturist at the Mary Livingston Ripley Garden, part of Smithsonian Gardens. The plant profile is on balloon flower, and we share what's going on in the garden as well as some upcoming local gardening events in the What's New segment. We close out with the last word on gardening with water from the late James Van Sweden. This episode, we're joined by Janet Draper. She is the horticulturist with Mary Livingston Ripley Garden that is part of the Smithsonian Gardens in Washington, D.C. Welcome, Janet. Oh, thanks, Kathy. I'm delighted to be here. Great to have you. And you've been on my list to have on the podcast for a long time now, and I'm glad that our schedules are finally lining up and we can have you on to talk about all things about how gardening has changed over the length of your career. Yeah, it really has changed. Mm -hmm. So we'll dive into that in a minute. And I was also going to point out that I think, I don't know if you were the first, but you were amongst the first profile that we did in Washington Gardener magazine in the print edition. So oh, wow. I'm going to have to dig out that <laughs> issue at some point, maybe do a little reprise or update on that too. Yeah, that was, that was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. That was, we just turned 18 in March. So it would have been 17 to 18 years ago. Wow. Congratulations. Thanks. Yeah. Maybe we'll do some updated um, profiles of a bunch of people, like a kind of where are they now? I think that would be a, a good thing to do. And that's kind of how this podcast is serving too. So we like to ask our guests on the Garden DC podcast, were they born with a green thumb and chlorophyll in their veins or did they come to gardening later on? Mm, I am so fortunate that I was born into a gardening family. Um, I'm the youngest of six kids from Indiana, and both my parents were big gardeners. Well, my entire extended family, a uh, farming community. So we all gardened out in the vegetable garden and houseplants everywhere in the house. Uh, and of course, the original macrame hangers. Um, it's so cool to see all of those fashions coming back. Um, but, you know, we had plants everywhere. And my mom was really instrumental in making sure we all had this fascination with plants. Um, she showed us how to grow peanuts or where peanuts were how they're produced underground. Uh, we grew cotton. We grew Job's tears. So I could even during the winter, uh, I had seeds that I could string and make my own necklaces out of plants that I had grown. So very much a uh, gardening family that I grew up in. Hmm. Sounds like a wonderful childhood. It was. It was. So did you naturally think of horticulture as a career or was that something you pursued later? Yeah, no, I, I knew plants would be my career, but what exactly with plants? Um, so I, I didn't know, but, but I really loved plants and uh, I could think of no other thing that, that I was so excited about. And fortunate enough that Purdue University, a land grant university, was just 18 miles from home. And Purdue had a wonderful horticulture department at the time um, and still does. Um, so it was natural for me to go to Purdue and pursue a degree in horticulture. But 
even once I got that degree in horticulture, it, it provided a wonderful foundation for knowing um, the actual science behind the horticulture. But even after graduation, I still had no clue what I was going to do with plants as a career. And I actually, the smartest thing I've ever done in my life was to ask advice from my senior advisor, who was Dr. Harrison Flint, a lovely, lovely man, and just the Michael Durr of his time for Woody's. Um, just his knowledge, amazing. But I actually, right before graduation, I went to Dr. Flint and said, you know, what would you do? if you were in my situation? And he said, well, what are you interested in? And I basically rattled off anything that had chlorophyll. I love trees, I like palms, I love tropicals, I, I love perennials, I love this and that. And he's like, <laughs> whoa, sister, you know, <laughs> you, you really need to um, get some experience working in the field. And I had done a few internships during school, but not, not a tremendous amount. But Dr. Flint recommended that I take internships after I had this pedigree. And so I applied for a bunch and I was accepted at all but one. And so I took, took my options to him and he, he decided that the best place for me would be at Mount Cuba Center in Delaware. So, um, and little did I know he was sending me to work with one of his former colleagues, Dr. Richard Lighty. Um, and from there, uh, again, I just asked Dr. Lighty after the end of the summer, because Mount Cuba was wonderful, mm -hmm. but it wasn't, it didn't scratch all of my itches. So I asked Dr. Lighty, what would he do next? And he's like, oh, perennials and grasses are next, or the next big, Thing. You know, why don't you go learn from Kurt Blumel? So he sent me off to work for Kurt. And um, then Kurt wanted me to learn the European way of doing things. So Kurt sent me, or through, through Kurt's recommendations, I was able to work in Germany for a year. And while I was in Germany, they kept talking about this amazing garden in England. And so I wrote a letter to Beth Chatto, and she accepted me to work for her for a year. Um, and so I was like this pass along kid for a while. Um, and I did about five years of internships post graduation, um, which put me in parts of the world that I would never have seen or learned uh, from without doing those internships. Mm, amazing. So there's are some big names out there. And so those who are familiar with horticulture in the Mid-Atlantic, they know the legend that is Kurt Blumel. But for those outside our area, can you talk about him for a little bit? Oh, sure. Um, Kurt was a, a German immigrant, or Czechoslovakian, really. Um, and he started a nursery in Northern Maryland and was introducing uh, perennials to the American market. At, at the time, you know, perennials were, you know, if you could find 20 different perennials at a garden center, that was, they were very progressive. Really, there was only daylilies, peonies, and, oh, bearded iris, uh, and hostas. So those four pretty much dominated everything with perennials, but he was introducing ornamental grasses and, and plants we had never heard of. And because Wolfgang Ome of Ome van Sweden, a DC landscape architecture company, uh, Jim van Sweden and Wolfgang Ome were using, they were changing the way we were seeing horticulture because they were using perennials in mass sweeps and they were adding grasses. And these were not lawn grasses. 
These were what they were calling ornamental grasses, things like miscanthus and millennias and deschampsias and things that we Americans had never seen before. And so through Kurt providing the plant material and Wolfgang and Jim putting it out there and getting amazing marketing on their gardens, they really changed the way horticulture and um, gardens were viewed in the, uh, the early 90s, I would say, 80s through 90s. And I was right in the center of all of that. So very fortunate. Mm. And I think their book or the trend was called The New American Garden. Bold American Garden. Yeah. Bold American Gardens. Mm. And so that was a departure to bedding plants and shrubs, I assume? Um, before, uh, landscape architects really did not incorporate blooming flowers uh, like herbaceous perennials in mass sweeps. They would do a few, a few of this and a few of that. But Wolfgang was planting by the thousands. So a block of uh, Rudbeckia would be a thousand Rudbeckia. So uh, it was just astounding. And what he was doing, he was bringing the German aesthetic over to the U.S. and was just the first to do it here. So once you left those internships, how did you get into public gardens? <laughs> that was just, wow, what a shift. Um, all of those internships, I was trained as a propagator. Uh, that is that is my background. I, how to make more plants. Uh, and then I was working in Annapolis and I was asked if I would help design a garden for a private estate. And so I started doing private estate work and actually putting plants in the ground instead of in little black plastic pots like I had been doing all along. And from the estate work, and then I was doing uh, maintenance of many of Wolfgang and Jim's gardens, um, maintaining those those monstrous gardens. Um, it was really I was lonely. I mean, you you have these absolutely beautiful gardens, but if you're not sharing them with anyone, it was I don't know. It wasn't fulfilling for me. And then I was told that Smithsonian was hiring gardeners. And I'm like, Smithsonian has gardens? <laughs> and yeah, I I seriously did not know. Um, and now, you know, 27 years later, and it was a huge shock from going from a private estate where you saw absolutely no one to working on our national mall and we get about 20 million visitors a year to the mall. So, um, yeah, dramatic change. But it's been a good change. Mm -hmm. So it went from just a few people seeing your work to millions or multitudes. Um, and then, of course, worldwide from videos and photos people share from their travels and trips to D.C., yeah. Again, pinch me. I have been so fortunate, Kathy, to, um, I say this somewhat jokingly, but it's true. I've been paid to play in the dirt and share my passion about plants and gardens with people from around the world. And uh, it's it's been a good ride. Hmm. And Again, we do have listeners outside the Washington, D.C., Mid-Atlantic area. So let's describe and talk about the Mary Livingston Garden, Ripley Garden, uh, for a little bit and where it's located and the style of the garden. Sure, sure, sure. Um, the garden is, is a whopping about a third of an acre. For, so for a public garden, it's very small. And what it is is actually a rooftop garden. 
in the 1960s, the there used to be Ninth Street that came right across the mall between the old Arts and Industries building and the Hirshhorn Museum. And that road went underground. And actually, the Hirshhorn building was created after the road went underground. But then there was the potential that the space between the two museums would would become a parking lot. But luckily, Mrs. Ripley, who was the wife of our eighth secretary of the institution, really wanted people and gardens to be connected. So through the Women's Committee, which is a group of ladies, it's a wonderful fundraising arm of Smithsonian um, they raised the funds to create a wonderful garden uh, in this space. And what's so remarkable about it, it's, it's raised planters in the front of the garden, and then the walls sort of meander. So it's a casual, curvaceous garden. And then as you near Independence Avenue, the walls go down to ground level. So you are actually, in certain places, surrounded by the plant material. So things that are three feet up on a wall, you see them at a really close-up level, and you can see the details. And the whole idea of the garden was that it would be handicapped accessible. So mm -hmm. anyone, no matter what your abilities or challenges, can get up close and personal and touch and feel the plants. Mm -hmm. um, I'm the luckiest of the, the gardeners for Smithsonian because neither the Arts and Industries building or the Hirshhorn claims the Ripley Garden as its own. So I don't have any parameters that I have to work within. So when I first got there, my whole goal was to show people the amazing diversity of mother nature that's out there and show them really cool things. You know, plants, so often the same plants are used again and again. And yeah, they might be good plants, but oh, come on, there are so many other things out there. And um, since I had no, <laughs> no guidelines, I have just gone crazy. Um, I I like the mantra native to Mother Earth, but um, you know whatever I can get my hands on that is a good garden plant for our area, I will try to put on display. Um, some of it is to inspire people to. Uh, I'll show them things that they could grow in their own garden, or sometimes. I'll put in things that might be a little beyond the home gardener, like you'd need a greenhouse to overwinter things, but I want to show them really cool plants and have fun myself too. It really is. <laughs> a happy garden gardener means you'll have a happy garden. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's such a joy to visit. I was going to note on the accessibility, there's plenty of benches, yeah. you know, to sit down and just, you know, read or immerse yourself in the garden and just look around. It attracts a lot of urban wildlife. You get some nice birds visiting and everything else. Um, and then I was going to say most of our region is zone seven, you know, there's little pockets of zone six at some elevations, but I would say uh, the Ripley garden is almost zone eight. What do you think? Yes, very much so. Um, there, it's very protected. There are buildings on both sides, red brick radiating a lot of heat. The raised planters means it's very well drained. And then, you know, there's a lot of sources of hot air in Washington, D.C. So, yeah, very much a zone eight. <laughs> so, it's almost a, a peek into, you know, 10 years down the road with climate change, what your garden could be. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> and that does bring us to some of the changes and trends you've seen over the last few decades. And have you seen a, a change in the climate and zone in the last 20 plus years, just in that little garden? Um, I probably have. 
Yes, but I've been there for 27 years now. Um, and that's really not long enough to to show dramatic changes in that space. Um, every year is different. Every winter is different. Um, I think often we lose more plants due to winter wet than winter cold. Or last year, the dramatic drop in temperature. Mm -hmm. um, so I would not, it, it is different, mm -hmm. but in which way I, I demur on that. Okay. Yeah, I've just heard from other gardeners saying that, you know, things are blooming a little earlier or out of sequence um, than when they had planted it, you know, a few decades ago. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. But other changes that I have dramatically seen in horticulture in general, as I talked about Kurt Blumel bringing in new plants. Mm -hmm. The plant availability from back when I was graduating from college in the late 80s to now, it's, it's just astounding. And back in the day, to get information about plants, you searched books, you searched all of those things. We didn't have such information at our fingertips. But you know, beware that some of that information at our fingertips is not always accurate or maybe not accurate for your region. Um, you know, the, the availability of information is definitely there, um, but there's, there's a lot of stuff that I, I read and go, oh my goodness, that is not, not the case. Um, so just the availability of so many different plants and and much of that is done through plant breeding but it's just also you know more that's out there through the internet mm -hmm. um so that that is just so so huge and the information again when i was first first in the field I mean, James Underwood Crockett. Do you remember those books, Kathy? <laughs> yeah, I still have a few on the shelf. Yeah, the Time Life books. I yes. memorized them. Um, James Underwood Crockett and the Victory Garden, just that was a really good source of information. Um, and it was one of the only ones that were American sources of, of information. Rather... Um, all the books that were out there were from a British perspective and the whole idea of double digging your planting beds and enriching your soil and add more compost and add more compost versus now we realize for many, many plants, that is the worst thing you can do for your plants is to give them an overly rich diet. And when's the last time you talked about dividing plants? Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe daylilies and iris you still need to divide, but so many other things, no. We're, so the science of horticulture has really progressed dramatically through, through the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I recall a lot of um, pushing of peat, I would call it. Yeah. Um, so they were, you know, it was grown in straight peat, a lot of plants. And then that's what you were supposed to dig out the hole, take out the native soils, and then just basically stick it in a peat hole. Well, or incorporate peat and mm -hmm. compost together for water holding capacity. Mm -hmm. And with the storms that we have around here, oh my gosh, you were creating a bathtub and your plants were rotting. Um, so yeah, we've, We've learned so much and learned that plants are very much like people that were all adapted or more comfortable in certain areas um, and gravel gardens. Oh, my goodness. Um, you never 30 years ago, 
gardening and gravel was so unheard of. Mm -hmm. And that's why when Beth Chatto turned her parking lot into a gravel garden, it was so revolutionary because it was something that had never been done. And now gravel gardens are, are everywhere. So we, we have learned so much and there's still so much to learn about horticulture and the art of creating a garden. So true. Yeah. So much out there that hasn't been researched yet. And before we get off the topic of access to plant information and availability and the old days of catalogs, I wanted to ask, do you miss having some of those print catalogs available to you and being able to pour over them on a, like a long winter's night? Oh, I still love my print catalogs. And yes, <laughs> I still, I still get them. I have a whole pile of them behind me right now. Um, you know, pretty soon I'm going to have to be thinking about what what I'm putting in the garden next year and what am I doing different next year. And I love those catalogs just to spur, uh, spark ideas with me. Um, and so absolutely. I mean, you can scroll the internet, but usually I end up down some rabbit hole researching something. Um, and, but the catalogs, absolutely. I love, I love print. Mm -hmm. And being able to use them as a reference for years to come. There's such a great resource. Mm -hmm. hmm. So let's talk about um, the uses of chemicals in the garden. So we talked a little bit about peat and how mm -hmm. that's kind of gone down. Um, how about the spraying programs that used to be? Mm. We have wisened up on that one too. Um, yeah, I, I have to say that I am as organic as I possibly can be in the Ripley garden. Um, I don't want to be messing around with chemicals. Uh, I want all the, the insects around. Um, so, and you know, just the whole idea that we're calling them insects instead of pests. Um, back, back in the day, the, the idea was a good plant was, was something that had no pests, no, no uh, diseases and basically bloomed a long time. So we didn't care about any pollinators coming to it or anything like that. And now it was, it really was, you see a hole in your plant, you know, figure out how to kill it, you know, squish it or whatever. But now, I mean, I'm so happy when I see like bug holes. It, it means that, the garden is providing life for someone. Um, hopefully they're, they're invited guests, but still there's been a major paradigm shift between we finally realized that there is no life without the insects. And it's not only the honeybees that are pollinators. It is the entire web of life. And we are only just a little speck in that web. And we need to respect the rest of the web and stop using so many chemicals. Um, many, many people have have heard and are not using them, um, but we still have a long way to go. Um, but within the industry, I, I would say they're using more um, good bugs to take care of pests in greenhouse situations. So huge step forward. Mm -hmm. So the term integrated pest management, IPM, you know, really wasn't around a few decades ago. They, there might've been some people practicing it, but the actual industry and, and then teaching others to do it definitely has evolved in the last couple of decades. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so how about garden maintenance itself? Do you find that people are interested in a less formal look to their garden um, or more formality or how are they tending to their gardens? Well, um, I can only really talk about how I tend to gardens and my gardens are wild and crazy. And, um, you know, I am not not the kid that separates his peas from his mashed potatoes. I mean, I, my peas go into my mashed potatoes and mix them all up. 
Um, so I think overall, we've realized plants like to mingle. Plants are social. The leaders in the industry are talking plant communities um, and how how plants are naturally interact with each other. Uh, home gardeners are still a little reluctant to have everything touching, but we're getting better about using plants as a ground cover and using plants instead of mulch. Uh, you know, people used to really love to see all that mulch and then their little soldier-like plants planted out in a row. And we're getting beyond that. Um, I hate to see mulch. I I rarely mulch anymore. I just, it, it's not necessary because I've planted so many plants. So I have a green mulch and not a brown mulch. So, and the other thing that we have learned about garden maintenance is, you know, we used to put our gardens to bed in the winter, you know, and just, when are you going to cut it back? When are you going to do this? When are you going to, we're not doing that anymore, which is wonderful. We have finally realized brown is beautiful also. And there's, there's a subtle beauty in seeing the tawny colors during the winter, but also the importance of leaving those seed heads up and leaving those things for the birds and the insects to have a place to live during the winter, to overwinter, and then also leaving the leaves on the ground so that things like a brown thrasher, a bird, will can actually live up to its name. I mean, the brown thrasher is known, you can pick him out in a in a woods because you'll hear all this rustling through the leaves on the ground as he's searching for for insects to eat. Mm -hmm. That's that's where the name comes from. And when we take away all of those leaves, there's nothing left for them. So we're we're finally realizing less is more in the garden and leave those those twigs leave leave a few leaves or leave as many as possible I try and leave all of my leaves in the garden um just a garden is more than just serving us um versus it used to be a garden the whole purpose of a garden was beauty Mm -hmm. period. It was all about beauty and it was all about the satisfaction of the gardener or whoever was paying the gardener to do the work. But now we realize a garden is so much more. I mean, that's that's such a seismic shift that it's not just about us and that a garden can provide so much more. And, you know, it's essential. So less is more. Mm -hmm. So the whole definition of gardening or what a garden is has evolved. Totally changed. I mean, more people are looking at a meadow and calling that a garden. Or, um, you know, before a garden had to be like structured and controlled and it was man's control over nature. And now uh, for... For many people, it's more of man's appreciation of nature and giving up control. And it's it's a beautiful thing. But we still have a lot of lawns and a lot of people that are just so afraid that someone's going to say that their lawn looks messy. We've made a lot of progress, but... We're not a gardening nation yet. Mm. Well, we're we're slowly pushing them there, right? Oh, we're we're trying. <laughs> we're trying. Um, and I was going to say about some of the messiness in the embrace of wildlife and some of those, you know, wild and woolly plants is in tandem with the native plant movement and embracing what was considered a weed, like literally golden ragwort or those type of plants, um, now being seen in a typical perennial border. 
Oh, absolutely. Just a huge shift. It used to be our native plants were shipped off to Europe to get a pedigree or, you know, to be anointed as it's a good garden plant before we would accept them. We we just, uh, I guess it's so common that when things are all around you, you don't appreciate them. But when someone else has it and you see it in their garden, it's like, oh, that's a cool plant. Well, it's the same thing that's been growing all along that you you mow off every year. So, and even we don't call them weeds anymore. You notice that? They're not mm-hmm. weeds, they're natives. Mm-hmm. So just that nomenclature shift, um, it's it really, it sounds like a little thing, but it's a dramatic thought process. Um, and it, it's a good thing. We're finally realizing that, you know, we've been paving paradise for so long um, and uh, it's time to try and plant it back. Mm-hmm. And we're realizing planting paradise back is not as easy as Mother Nature nature made it look like it was. Because mm-hmm. once the soil is altered it's not the same it might be native to the region but that's not the same soil that it was growing in originally no no and because the soil has been disturbed a lot of invasives have come in and uh, they will be they will outcompete our natives and many of those natives came in from people you know i propagated miscanthus for years at Blue Mouse. Um, we propagated millions because we did not know. Um, the plants were coming from Europe. They were being bred usually um, uh, Dr. Ernst Pagels uh, in Northern Germany was a big miscanthus breeder back in the early 90s. And the plants were sterile in Northern Germany. And so Kurt would import them to the U.S., you know, legally and, and all of that. He would import them and we would propagate them and grow them out. But because of our longer seasons and our hotter seasons, those plants weren't, weren't um, the seed was viable for us. But we didn't know until we realized, oh my goodness, that's a problem. So many plants that are now invasive were brought in by horticulturists. Mm -hmm. Um, And I, I, it just, oh, Um, (laughs) but once you know, you stop and you, you do the right thing. But our country is so large, what could be a problem in one region might be fine somewhere else. So it's, it's very complex to try to say what is a problem and what is not, but the gardener knows. If you're in your garden and you have a plant that just keeps self-sowing or is overly aggressive and you can't control it, maybe it's time to get rid of that plant unless it is native and um, naturally occurring in that area. Mm-hmm. Um and I would say that the even just the awareness of invasives has definitely been a trend over the last 20 years. Like, you know, maybe people knew about English ivy and some of the other big garden aggressive plants, but um, all of the invasives that yes. are in our region have got a much higher profile in the last 10 to 20 years. Well, I mean, look around. I mean, Ampelopsis taking taking over everywhere and it's still being sold by certain um, garden centers. Mm. And so we, we can do better. We mm-hmm. can do better. We, once you know, you can do better. Mm-hmm. Well, changing directions to the opposite end of the plant spectrum. Let's talk a little bit about the tropical look and craze that's starting <laughs> to come up. So that's like uh, uh, bringing in things that wouldn't normally be thought of as a garden plant. Yeah, well, I mean, 
the the can of banana craze started mm-hmm. gosh in the 80s mm-hmm. uh, and we that was a uh, uh, one of these weird trends, the Victorians actually did the cannas and bananas whole thing way back when. Uh, and then it fell out of fashion because it was very expensive. You had to have a greenhouse to overwinter these things. Um, but now, again, with plant availability and plants becoming relatively cheap and, you know, to overwinter a banana, it's not a not a big thing. Um, oh yeah, bringing, bringing things out for the summer and the, in the DC metro area with our heat and humidity, oh my gosh, a normal perennial, yeah, kind of says hasta luego, you know, I'm out of here. I'm, I'm going to take a break during this heat and humidity and then Mm -hmm. it'll regrow again in the autumn. But the tropicals, for for a public gardener, they love the heat and humidity, and they put on a dynamite show. And so, absolutely, there has been a um, big trend to put out more tropicals, or or just bring your house plants out. You know mm-hmm. that that breaking down the barriers of what is a house plant, where does this plant go bringing your vegetables out of the vegetable garden and putting them in your front yard or mixed in with things. These are all horticultural trends that, you know, we're starting to break down barriers, really. Um, And saying it's okay. I mean, it's okay to put pink and yellow together. It's okay to grow parsley in your front yard. It's okay if you want to you know, bring your, your, uh, house plants out and stick them in the garden for the summer. Um, yeah. And I, I haul a lot of tropicals in and out. And, um, you know, when you need a forklift to move palm trees, um, it's, but again, I'm, I'm working in the public area. Um, and my home garden, I do not do those kind of things. Um, but, to create a public display. Absolutely. And it's, it's so much fun to see the tropicals and they just, they go crazy in this heat. Mm -hmm. And I always say that um, what we call a house plant is native somewhere. Like people oh, think that they were born in a store no, and I'm like, no, no, uh, no, no. that came from somewhere, some tropical yeah. rainforest or somewhere where it actually likes to be outside. It doesn't love yeah. to be inside your house. So giving it a little summer vacation is always a great idea. Yeah. Yep. And so you're talking a little bit about your home garden and the tropicals that you might take in and out. So in our last few minutes together, how has your own home gardening changed? Have you done more foodscaping? Have you um, incorporated more tropicals or how have you changed over the last few decades? Oh, I'm incorporating more natives. Mm -hmm. Um, I really, I am far from a purist um, in thinking that I have to have only native plants but I, when possible, I am adding natives over a um, non-native. Um, just our insect population really needs those plants. Um, and the more everyone can do their part by just planting a couple of natives, um, I have Cassia marilandica in the backyard, and I see little yellow sulfur butterflies that that caterpillar only feeds on uh, ca- members of the Cassia family. I mean, my little garden at home can help support and sustain an entire class of butterfly. So it doesn't take a huge amount of land or a huge effort on my part to help the insects out there and um, helping the insects, helping the birds. I mean, gosh, the birds need insects to feed their young. Um, So yeah, just, 
I plant more natives. Um, but again, I'm not only natives, but when, when possible, I'll choose a native. Mm-hmm. And how can our listeners contact you to find out more about the Smithsonian Gardens and maybe contact you yourself? Uh, me, myself, email is drape, D-R-A-P-E-J-A, at si.edu. That's drape, ja, at si.edu. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram, Smithsonian Gardens, hashtag Smithsonian Gardens. We do all kinds of informative uh, videos and talk about plants all the time. And then also, if you go to Smithsonian Gardens website, we have an entire library of lectures that have been taped and you can watch them at your convenience for free. Um there's there's just a wealth of information there on our website. Mm, excellent. And how can people who might be visiting DC access the Ripley Garden and when would they run into you? Oh, well, the garden is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There are no gates. Um, and I am there usually Monday through Friday, 6.30 in the morning and <laughs> until uh, early afternoon. Um, but uh, if they email me in advance and, uh, yeah, I'm I'm a public figure. It, mm-hmm. I'm out there. So just contact Smithsonian Gardens and they can get you in contact with me. Great. Well, thank you so much, Janet, for sharing these thoughts and memories over your last 25 plus years at Smithsonian Gardens and your horticultural story. Any last thoughts on where gardening has evolved from and where it is going in the future? Oh, gosh. The future is green. Um it is really bright. There, there are so many young, up and coming environmental uh, people are aware of the environment and the love for growing plants. Um, the house plant craze is just fabulous. Um, and once you start nurturing a plant, um, it really is a great disease to have, and it'll hook you for life. And it is, it's a good passion to have. So hopefully the future is growing. Thank you, Janet. (laughs) You're welcome, Kathy. Thanks for the opportunity. Balloon flower plant profile. Balloon flower, platycodon, grandiflorus, is an attractive perennial flower that is native to parts of Russia and Asia. It is a member of the Campanula family that includes Lobelia and Bellflower. It is hardy to USDA zones 3 to 8. The flowers bloom in summer and are typically a true blue, white, or pink. The flower gets its name from the buds that form a hollow balloon then pop open into a star-shaped blossom. The flower stalks are generally between 18 to 36 inches tall, though some dwarf cultivars top out at about 12 inches high. Balloon flower prefers to grow in full to part sun in moist but well-draining soils. Fertilizer is not necessary. You can give it a light mulching of composted leaves once the plant emerges in spring. It is deer resistant and fairly disease free. Slugs and snails can be an issue for it in some climates. If you let the seed heads form, it can self slow around the mother plant, but is not really weedy or invasive. To prevent reseeding, simply deadhead the spent flowers. You can also propagate new plants by saving the seeds and planting them in mid to late spring. The roots are fragile and resent disturbance, so once planted in a spot, avoid digging around the root zone or moving the plants. Balloon flower, you can grow that. What 
what's new this week in the garden? Well, I spent most of it touring beautiful home gardens and public gardens in Minneapolis, Minnesota with the Garden Communicators Association, Garden Com. And I received a wonderful award for this podcast. Garden DC won the gold level award for best podcast overall. So congratulations to all of those who have helped out with the podcast, who have been guests on the podcast, supporters and listeners. You all helped make it happen. Thank you all so much. In the home garden, I'm noticing the abelia is really blooming up a storm right now, as are some of the later hydrangeas over at the community garden. The peppers are starting to come on prolifically, as are the dahlias in the cutting garden. So I was happy to make a small bouquet of those and enter a few cut flowers, as well as some of our potatoes and garlic into the Montgomery County Fair. And I guess we'll see in a week or so if we won any ribbons for those. And local gardening events coming up, uh, one you want might want to attend in person is part of the Foodie Friday series hosted by Montgomery Parks. And this one is on August 25th from 6.30 to 8 p.m. It's entitled The People's Medicine, and that takes place at josiah henson museum and park and that is a friday evening you can sign up for that at montgomeryparks.org under their events tab Um, the people's medicine is about how plants have been used in medicine for thousands of years the speaker is rhiannon smith founder of kiyoshi botanicals so it should be a fascinating talk another upcoming event and this one is virtual and it is a free webinar hosted by the USDA and it is entitled Climate Smart Agriculture and Who's in the Garden and that takes place on Thursday August 31st at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. You can register for that at usda.gov slash peoples dash garden slash webinars. Happy gardening! In the new book, The Urban Garden by Kathy Jensen Terry Spade, you'll find dozens of inspiring and creative ways to grow flowers, shrubs, vegetables, herbs, and other plants in small spaces and with a limited budget. Whether you want to grow on a balcony, rooftop, front stoop, or a tiny urban patio, turn your growing dreams into reality and build a gorgeous and unique garden that showcases your personal style while still being functional and productive. With the ingenious ideas and resourceful tactics found here, you'll be maximizing yields and beauty from every square inch of your space while also making a lush outdoor living area area you'll crave spending time in. Whether you're growing edible plants or beautiful flowers, the 101 amazing growing ideas found in the urban garden will turn your tiny urban yard into a treasure trove of green you'll be proud to share with family and friends. Buy your copy today at your local retail bookseller or order it online now at amazon.com or bookshop.org. Get low maintenance alternative to lawns with the new book Ground Cover Revolution by Kathy Jets. Reducing the lawn is among the biggest trends in home ownership, with an endless stream of homeowners looking for an eco friendly alternative to a traditional everyday grass lawn. In the last few years alone, over 23 million American adults converted part of the lawn to a natural landscape and now are looking to do even more. The biggest challenge to adopting this new ideal of perfect lawn is knowing how and when to replace your turf and which plants are the best ones for the job. Ground Cover Revolution is here with all the answers you need. Included are 40 in-depth profiles of plants that are perfect choices for replacing a grass lawn. There are options for sun, for shade, for dry and wet sites, and for various climates around the globe. There are choices that bloom, options that are evergreen, and selections that are deer resistant. Author Kathy Jens has also included an incredibly useful chart that gives you all the details on each of the 40 choices for quick reference and to make your ground cover selection process even easier. Whether you want to replace the entire lawn or just reduce the amount of land dedicated to turf, Ground Cover Revolution will help you usher in a new and improved idea of what a beautiful lawn should be. Available at bookstores now and also at Quarto.com, where you can get 30% off using discount code GARDENING30.
The Last Word on Gardening with Water by the late James Van Sweden. Water can play a role in any garden, no matter the budget or the garden size. Even if the part it plays is a small one, water will magnify the pleasures of your private paradise. Throughout history, gardens have evolved most spectacularly wherever water was abundant or could be channeled to flow. In early Egypt and Mesopotamia, water was a precarious resource. It had to be husbanded, lured into sophisticated patterns to irrigate vegetables and herb gardens. Over time, the channels used for agriculture evolved into decorative canal systems and ponds containing fish and water plants, such as lotus and papyrus. The notion that paradise could be mirrored here on Earth in the form of a terrestrial oasis first took root in Egypt and then moved west. Historically, water has transformed every environment to which it has been introduced, from the desert groves of Egypt to the English pastoral landscapes of the 18th century, created by British landscape gardener Lancelot Capability Brown. You can find the same cross-axial grid used in early Islamic water gardens underpinning the 17th century designs of Versailles and Volet Vicomte, and in the 19th and 20th century American gardens, such as a perennial border at Central Park designed by Frederick Law Olmsted and Beatrice Farron's design for Dumbarton Oaks. Whether introduced out of necessity for feeding animals or irrigating plants, or for sheer pleasure, water's effect is the same. It expands and enriches the world around us. It cools and makes the air lighter, reflects movement and color, and creates a constant music. Leave a dish of water outside for a few minutes. When you check back, you may find you attracted a few finches for a drink. The sun and clouds are reflected there. You can even see the wind's rippling fingerprint. It's that easy to start a water garden. In my own garden, I use a concave top of a pattery lantern made by Marie Wu for a bird bath. I wouldn't think of changing the original design of the garden by introducing a constructed water feature, but most gardens benefit from the formal introduction of a pond, a swimming pool, a fountain. Even small suburban backyards will seem larger or have more diversity with a pond or pool or both. The amount of available space and your budget will determine the proper scale of your pond, fountain, or pool. The simplest water forms built from ordinary materials are often the most beautiful. Gardening with water is a rewarding challenge on every scale, and the same design principles apply to each one. This has been the last word on Gardening with Water by the late James Van Sweden. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to anchor.fm slash garden DC slash support. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to washingtongardener.com. Thank you. You can find Washington Gardener online at WashingtonGardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.